We're rolling. I'm back in plenary session, video editioned, joined by the great Dr. Mark Lithgow. Dr. Lithgow is an oncologist. He is based out of London, and he um, is a terrific person who's doing terrific research. He's also on Twitter. Uh, Mark, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Oh, thanks, Benai. Delighted to be asked. Big fan of the show, of course. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to, it's great to have you. Um, so, you know, I wonder if you might just take a minute and tell listeners uh, what your clinical practice is like now in London. Uh, what are the types of patients you see? Uh, and what's your interest in oncology? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm a sort of what's an academic clinical fellow, medical oncology. So I'm currently at Imperial College in London. So I'm doing a, a PhD sort of exploring the uh, modulation of the cancer microbiome. But um, before I uh, sort of studied medicine, I worked as a pharmacist for a few years. So I'm generally quite interested in sort of meta research, health policy, and quite uh, interested in sort of drug regulation and drug approvals as well. So we did some interesting work, I think. <laughs> so you've done a lot of stuff, PhD. Well, not yet, not yet. My, oh, my, uh, that's yet to come. Mark, yes. you're glutton for punishment. You're glutton for training. How many more years, my friend? Uh, I don't know. So in the UK, so I think training's a bit longer than sort of in the US. So I think it's because you have to wait longer for spots to open up. Yeah, that that definitely. Uh, but also, you know, people take, you know, two, have them do a PhD over three years. I think in the US, you do it sort of a bit quicker. And I think I our see. training's a bit longer as well. So in other words, you're saying it's better. It's better training. It's better. <laughs> it's long. Longer, longer, longer. Long. Better, questionably, um, but yeah. No, the microbiome so. in cancer, it's a, it's a yeah. hot topic. Definitely. Yeah, so there's a couple of really big uh, papers published a couple of months ago in Science where they did a fecal uh, microbiota transplant, and these were patients that weren't responding to checkpoint inhibitors um, in melanoma. And what they did is they gave them the microbiome or FMT from patients that were responding and I saw that. then it transformed their sort of response rate. So it's an interesting paper. Yeah. I should discuss it on this podcast. I recall I looked at that paper. I was looking for a control arm. Where was that control arm in that paper? Yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> there was no control arm, but still, you know, I think it's a proof of concept. Uh -huh, it's interesting. Of it's an interesting idea. I mean, yeah. I guess um, if in fact, you know, I guess someday we'll find it out, but I mean, I guess that's the idea. The idea would be that there's something about, the ratio of what do they call them? Firmicutes, firmicutes, yeah. and uh, is that the type yeah, of bug yeah, in the it's gut? All the different ratios. So alpha diversity is the. Uh, is they call it alpha say. diversity. I see. And you want yeah. like, and so the theory is that if the right ratio were in the gut in combination with the checkpoint inhibitor, yeah, then then things will start working. Yeah. So there's been some really good studies, and you know, like, um, so a chap at Imperial, David Panato, showed that if pa patients have antibiotics whilst they're on immune checkpoint inhibitors. They generally do much worse. Than, I see. Um, but it could also be the condition that required the antibiotics to be administered. It could be. It, it, it could, could be, be but, could you know, be, chicken or the egg, isn't it? But definitely. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. But that's interesting. I mean, I think it's, it's something fruitful worth studying. And, uh, and I look yeah. forward to sort of a, a nice controlled study. I guess the yeah. control would be, I would imagine, so fecal transplant versus, um, you could give somebody their own stool back. I mean, that would be your control. Yeah, so, then you yeah. so they do that, there's some stem cell, uh, so they do it in stem cell transplants as well, mainly because, you know, by the time patients are having stem cell transplants, they've got normally got lots of nasty, gut, you know, uh, antibiotic resistant bugs. I so see. if you give, if you change the microbiome then, and they do get an infection, then likely it's to be, you know, much more, you know, easily to treat with, with sort of antibiotics. I see, well, uh, okay. Lots of, revenue, lots of uh, interesting avenues, but definitely. I see, okay, good. So we will keep a, a close eye on this field. You're here to talk about a different paper. You're here to talk about registration studies and an important yeah. issue racial diversity. So I wonder if you might talk a little bit about what, what piqued your interest in this topic? What got you interested in it? Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, you know, obviously we, some of the big journals say, so, you know, just looking at sort of the New England Journal of Medicine, they, they generally, you know, talk about sort of institutional racism and sort of, uh, and also, you know, about how we need to recruit sort of a, a, a sort of more diverse population for sort of clinical studies. But then if you actually sort of look at um, the studies in sort of the big journals, the amount of times that they actually talk, actually report race is actually quite low. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, the first thing to do would really be to, to actually acknowledge this sort of a, an issue by sort of, you know, mandating that, that sort of people, uh, that, that sort of journals report uh, sort of race. Um, I see. That's interesting. So I guess what you're saying is they talk a good game. But let's yeah. see what they actually yeah, do. Exactly. So, let's see what they do. Yeah, let's see definitely. what they do. Um, I did try a letter for a big journal, and yeah, obviously, it was a, 
a speedy, speedy rejection. So. Oh, so interestingly, so they weren't so interested in hearing the feedback. <laughs> no, exactly. So, but wow. definitely, you know, I think, um, and so I think, you know, underreporting is a, is a massive problem. And, you know, I think definitely, you know, once we acknowledge there is a, a, a racial diversity problem, you know, once we report it, then, you know, we can ascertain the, the sort of extent of the problem, really. I see. Okay, good. I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I think, um, <laughs> you know, the first step in any question is to just document what's actually going on. And uh, the first step on issues of reporting is to see what they're actually reporting. So, well, yeah. They actually have uh, their own sort of, you know, the International Committee of uh, General and Medical Ah, uh, the ICMJE, my favorite yeah, people yeah. in the world. So okay. in their guidelines, they specify that you should, you know, uh, for variables such as race where you don't know the significance, they sh should be reported. So that was sort of, I see. You know, a bit of the premise for, for this sort of study. Interesting. Oh, so they actually say that, huh? Yeah. Do they have any guidelines in there about whether or not you should write your own paper? Because that's something that I don't see happen to <laughs> Um I, I think they're a bit more nebulous on that matter. <laughs> yeah, a bit more nebulous. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, yeah, part, yeah. Yeah, that part's weaker. Okay. Well, all right. So this is how you, you first got interested in it. You've taken a look uh, now. You first looked at prostate cancer. And, you know, and there, and I think there are substantive reasons why one might want to know that information on the racial makeup of, of clinical trials in prostate cancer. I wonder if you'll walk us through, you know, why did you start with prostate cancer and, 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 um, and, and, and yeah, and, definitely. Yeah. So we know that the, you know, the, the sort of disparities are quite significant in prostate cancer. So, you know, if you look at the sort of, um, sort of black, um, sort of instance and the sort of white Caucasian instance, there's definitely sort of some big dis disparities and also in the aggressiveness and, and the stage of presentation as well. So I think, you know, I'm generally you know, quite interested in GU oncology. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's an area that I was quite interested to sort of look at. And there has been some really interesting studies uh, in this area. So there was a good general oncology paper by Laurie in 2019, which sort of looks at all sort of different types of cancers. Uh, but obviously, you know, the, the one that sort of stood out for me was, was really sort of prostate cancer. And there are, has been some um, studies that have looked at sort of a similar question in prostate cancer, but no one's really looked at the sort of um, the specific FDA sort of uh, approval trials. And really, the reason that I sort of was really interested to look at that was because, you know, the FDA did actually write some very good guidelines mm. in 2016. I and see. so we were keen to see you know, the effect that these guidelines have had sort of on uh, sort of race reporting and also the diversity in trials as well. So we sort of looked at five years after and 10 years before to mm. sort of do a, do a sort of comparison between them. Fascinating. And the paper's out now. It's called Race Reporting and Diversity in U.S. Food and Drug Administration Registration Trials for Prostate Cancer 20, 2006 to 2020. Um, and this is in prostate cancer and prostatic diseases. There's... Yes, it's in the Definitely. it's 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 when you want to focus on the prostate, you pick up a copy. Exactly, exactly. You know, prostate you cancer for more focus cancer. just on your disease area. Then it's, every it month they have the right lobe and then the left lobe issues. They have the two <laughs> the two issues. You don't want to exactly. don't want to mix them up accidentally. You want to make sure exactly. you're in the right. And definitely, lobe. one of the co-authors is a, a big fan of the journal. My, my colleague, Doctor Savage, so he sort of suggested it. That's good. Well, at some point, you know. You know, I've I've been there. I'd start taking suggestions from anybody at some point. Take <laughs> take any suggestion. Where do we send this paper? Okay, good. But I mean, it's a it's really important. I mean, I think um, it's really important. Um, and um, and 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 I wonder if you might just walk us through the findings. I mean, what what did you find? I mean, the first question, of course, is who's reporting this information. The next yeah. question is what are they reporting? And then the next question is, did they actually get better uh, when they actually issued guidelines? Yeah, so I mean, these are you know definitely sort of really good questions. And so you know, we looked at a period, so fifteen years, so so ten years before the FDA guidelines, and, and five years afterwards. And so we noticed there was sort of seventeen uh, sort of new drug registrations over ten unique drugs. Mm. And when you look at the uh, sort of licensing publication, so the the publication in you know in the New England Journal of Medicine or the Lancet, then only around about sort of 50% of them actually reported race. And then if you look at that 50% that did report race, then sort of, you know, almost sort of 40% of them only really reported sort of partial information. So for example, only white versus non-white or, or, or sort of those, those sorts of groups. So, so not really sort of a, a sort of adequate uh, reporting. And generally what we tried to do then was to go and look at the FDA documentation. And we were expecting, you know, hopefully to get 100% um, sort of compliance 
but that's right. unfortunately, yeah, it wasn't quite hundred percent. It was good, but it, it, you know, there was definitely you know a couple of studies that that you know you've got no idea as to the the sort of uh, sort of racial diversity of participants in, in these trials. <clears throat> so, I'm not happy with this. I mean, I think <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I think we have to come back to the fact that. Um, you know, like why, why, I mean, why should, I mean, just kind of like reiterate, like why this would really matter is that, you know, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, like what is their goal? I mean, I think we, we, we forget, I mean, these some days we forget what their goal is. Uh, I think the recently they just forgot for a few days, they forgot what the hell they're doing. I think their goal, God forbid, is to regulate drug products in a way um, that's relevant to Americans. And the thing about Americans is, we are uh, people of all different races, all different ethnicities, all different backgrounds, all different heritages. Um, and, um, and, and some of those things may impact how the therapies work in us. Not all of those things, not always, but sometimes they do. Um, uh, but um, the other thing about us is that, uh, the other thing about Americans is that, you know, often those of us who have cancer, we're older, we're frailer. Um, after we progress on initial therapies, we get access to certain drugs because we have a certain insurance yeah. system, a certain thing. And the goal of the FDA is to say that in this environment, Americans, how they look the way they look, they are the way they are. In this environment, how do you um, ensure that these drugs will make us better off? I mean, I think that's the core question. And so, and go on, you want to say something? Yeah, no, no, I think it's a really good point. And you know, I think if you if you've got some time in your hand and you read the FDA documentation, yes. And they actually did a review, and uh, they found that sort of around about sort of twenty percent or one fifth of drugs actually demonstrate sort of differences in sort of exposure and response across different sort of race and ethnic groups. So, you know, I think there's definitely some acknowledgement within the within the guidance that the, that this is something that should should and needs to be reported. Yes, I, um, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I and I think the, the point I, I want to finish driving home is that um, is that they fail. I mean, in my opinion, they fail. And here's why they fail. They are allowing the companies to use contract research organizations that go predominantly in countries that have different uh, development. They're low and middle income countries. They have different access to resources. Um, they have different healthcare system development, meaning they probably don't have access to certain second line drugs. They have different racial makeup. They may not want to report the racial makeup because you might be in a country um, in Eastern Europe where it's predominantly Caucasian. Um, that might not be relevant for um, United States. Uh, um, you know, a, a, a white person in Eastern Europe who has no therapy post progression, who is 10 years younger than the average person in this country, uh, who's not taking any other medications for comorbidities might have less to do with somebody here in a, uh, uh, in a multicultural diverse yeah. society who's older on different medications, different BMI, uh, you know, different um, post protocol therapy. Um, and, and the more that these differences accumulate, the less relevant the data is. Um, and in prostate cancer is particularly relevant because prostate cancer um, for better or worse, uh, is a cancer, as you point out, uh, known for uh, disparities, particularly for Black individuals who seem to suffer yep. disproportionately from this disease. So, um, okay, what? So, what? So, you. So, the first thing you found was this reporting. Did it get better, Mark? Did it get better when they changed the guidance? Well, it depends how you define better. So, you know, yes, there was a slight percentage gain, but you know, we're talking, you know, less than sort of five five percent. So, so, statistically so significant, be... but not clinically meaningful. Yeah, so in so other words, know. right where we like to be in oncology. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but you know, we've repeated this sort of study in in recently, you know, breast cancer, and you know, we're presenting a poster sort of next week at Esmo Breast, and and that is actually, you know, when the FDA introduced this criteria, then suddenly there's a their reporting rate's gone massively much better. You know, oh, it's the nine percent. Really? So you're yeah. saying it's better in breast cancer? So, and, and the question is what, you know, what, what's the difference between breast cancer, you know, breast cancer and prostate cancer? Is it so, the... Definitely. So, you know, I think it's a, you know, really the interesting. Ribbon? And I'm not quite sure what the answer is between the differences that we've Yeah, what is the difference? Yeah. I mean, we, they both are, I mean, I was going to say, is it, is it that pink ribbon? Is that what motivated it? No, I mean, I they're, know, both, I mean you know, they're both cancers with, breast, you know, with is... robust patient groups. Yeah, go on. You know, triple negative breast does show again, sort of significant sort of, you know, race disparity in terms of outcomes and aggressiveness. So, you know, perhaps there are more, more driving factors, you know, just associated with, with, with the sort of, you know, with breast cancer more than sort of prostate cancer. But, but yeah, uh, I don't know is the <laughs> answer to the question. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, what next, Mark? W where do you go from here? I mean, you, you, you're, you're making a good point. I thought I saw somebody, you know, somebody recently, they also looked at it more broadly and, um, 
I think across all um, FDA approvals, even outside of oncology. Is that what I saw? There's a paper by Joe Ross and colleagues. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, that, you know, I think there's, there are there are definitely some really good papers, and I hope this is an issue that's becoming sort of you know m much more sort of topical, much more sort of debatable. So yeah. I think definitely you know this is a, an area that needs you know a lot more research. But I think you know once if we can get sort of medical journals to to sort of you know report sort of race. Yeah. Um, you know, it's the, it's the norm, then, you know, you're going to, people are going to do further research because, you know, the data is sort of out there. So I think, you know, it's really a, a sort of call on sort of medical journals to, to sort of, you know, mandate sort of reporting a bit more. Have you read uh, a little paper that I like to call um, Data Sharing with One uh, by Jenny Gill and I that appeared, I think, in Trends in Cancer the last year? I'm sure you must have read it because, we, you know, obviously it's the most important paper. Yes, really. Um. Yeah, I think you might have to remind me, remind me. Of the, uh, <laughs> the, the well, uh, the reason I think about it is, it, you know, um, we are in a moment where um, I see MJE a few years ago, they thought about data sharing. What does data sharing mean? It means share, uh, at least as they described it, for prospective clinical studies of human volunteers, share um, data uh, on those individual patients in the study uh, at least insofar as you can recapitulate the, the figures and tables of the paper. They didn't ask for more than that, just recapitulating the figures and tables of the paper. And this was ultimately struck down in their internal bureaucracy. Obviously, yeah. uh, a lot of pressure from the industry that they prefer not to share. Uh, although some companies claim that they share, it's really a farce because sharing where you have to apply through a, a year-long process and get approval and can only look at the data in a portal, you know, that ain't sharing at all. And anyway, so anyway, we, we, this is a long-standing debate about how much data sharing we should have. And in this data sharing, Jenny Gill and I noted one thing, that the FDA actually, they do have data sharing by, um, by the law. Um, they have access to individual patient-level data for drugs that they approve so that they have a copy of the data. We don't have a copy of the data. You and I don't have a copy, but they have a copy of the data. Presumably, they actually know the answer to that question in all of these trials, how many people are of whatever race you want, how old are they, what medicines they take. They know all the answers to those questions. Um, we don't know the answers. They know the answers. Um, so we looked at the papers that the FDA has published over a period of time, I forget off the top of my head, 10 years or so, and we asked how often using the information the FDA has, not necessarily as part of the purview of their job regulating drugs, how often do they leverage this information to ask a different question? What are those different questions and how well do they look? We publish this in Trends in Cancer. We call it data sharing with one because it's data sharing, but with just one other person at the FDA. Yeah. Yeah. And what we found was... Um, they use it for, I, I mean, you know, I, I, um, they use it for a number of quite interesting purposes. A lot of interesting things from surrogate validation to questions of diversity to, you know, population questions. Uh, you can read the paper. We kind of describe the things they do with it. They do it for a lot of interesting things. And they do a lot of interesting things with that data. And our argument is, this is what happens when you share with one other entity. Imagine what would happen if you shared more broadly. And I think that's the lesson is that if you had access to some of this data, you could ask the question of um, what is the racial makeup of this? And does race matter for some of these things? Does it actually matter for these therapeutics? I can ask a different question. I can ask, does censoring matter? What's the censoring rates? What's the completion of the quality of life questionnaire? Does that matter? You know, we can ask, you know, and th then we can ask the question that I can't even say what we're working on because we're going to publish that paper. Um, <laughs> cool. But we can ask questions about different plots and how you might plot things differently. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but but I think that's the key lesson is that um, we are limited in science by proprietary data. I believe that is contrary and antithetical to the to the uh, implicit social contract people make when they enroll in studies. I'm enrolling in a study because I'm donating my body for science to make the world better for people like me in the future. I'm not enrolling in the study so that a handful of investigators who may not have time or energy or interest or may not even think of the idea will conduct a, a sub tiny fraction of you know subsidiary studies, subsidiary yeah. studies. Um, I think that's the core tension. We still need to resolve it. Thoughts? No, yeah, definitely. I think um, you know having having access to data, you know, at least the sort of more people being able to reach different interpretations. I think you know, and hopefully it strengthens the the argument that whoever is originally set out to to sort of collect Local. the data has, yeah. has sort of reached. Uh, obviously, not always, but you hope sort of most of the time. But you know, that's science, isn't it? You know, that's people all have different opinions. You know, and, and having the data out there really helps people to to sort of validate and 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 sort of you know bring forth new ideas and 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 you know. So I think it's really important to to sort of have increased transparency. You know, with any sort of data for clinical trials, really.
Yes. In God we trust, all others bring data. And actually, I, I want to say this other thing that you made me think about. Clinical trials, it's different than other, I mean, I don't know, Mark, if I ask you to like, um, you know, pull every publication on uh, a VEGF TKI uh, ever done, every phase two study, and you meticulously go through the literature and you pull all the papers and you make an Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Somebody will say, well, should Mark share his data set? I say, you know, you know, I, I mean, that's a question. It's a fair question. Maybe in the future, Mark should share his data set. Um, but you know, for the time being, it's not a, it's not a proprietary data set. You can recapitulate the data set if you wish to, if you put Mark's elbow grease into it. And then the other thing is it's not a data set where people have volunteered. That's the difference with trials. With trials, the, the subject of the data in Mark's hypothetical data set is the study that's published on a, you know, you can go find it. The subject of the data in the trials is a human being who put their self on the line in order to further knowledge. And that is a different social contract. So I'm happy to have all total data sharing. You want data sharing, you can have data sharing. I'm happy to post everything we do. However, if you were to start someplace, you got to start at the place that makes the most sense, which to me these trials. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, no. I think, you know, these people enter, you know, pa patients enter clinical trials and the hope that they're going to further science, further new treatments. And I think, you know, sharing data is, is absolutely key. And that's what, you know, very much what any patient who goes on to a cancer trial or, or clinical trial beyond, you know, well beyond cancer, you know, hopes, I think. Very much agree. I'm glad to hear that, Mark. Mark, is it fair to say you're card carrying plannered? Are you a planner? Definitely, definitely. <laughs> I know in the UK you've got a, a lot of uh, a lot of fans. Definitely. I got the stats. Actually, uh, we're much we're, we're we're much more popular in Europe. We're we're, okay. we're yeah, we're uh we're an espresso. You know, Jewish we're not coffee. we're not drip coffee. We're not drip coffee. We're espresso. You know. Uh, very good. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> well, Mark Lithgow, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I think, um, you know, it's been great working with you. I don't know, listeners don't know, but we have a Zoom meeting uh, once a week where the whole laboratory, as you know, our lab gets together, Mark. We get the whole lab Definitely. together once a week, the whole lab. Um, there's always exactly. somebody who has suffered a recent pipetting injury, you know, but we let them rest. We give them a week off, two weeks off, um, get the lab uh, together and we have a chat. It's a good, always a good chat. I think we're waiting for uh, we're waiting for the photo of uh, yourself in a, a lab coat with a uh, pipette. <laughs> I'm sure gotta Logan, add, gotta, Logan, add, that Logan the, gotta add that to the lab site. Yeah. 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 But you know, um, I always enjoy the lab meetings because, uh, and you're always one of the people who fight me. You fight me all the time. <laughs> Fighting me. Like, that's not, that's not, a, I don't know about that idea. I don't know. You always have a look on your face that's dissatisfied and actually love it because review uh, I'm trying to be you're the review. <laughs> we invited reviewer two. Yeah, yeah. Let reviewer two in here. Yeah, as well, but you know, it's good. Yeah, you always want you always want to be a, a critical critical person in the room. So, Mark. No, I mean, you know, I think we've got some. You know, we've got those really exciting projects. I think, you know, but I think sometimes, you know, maybe, you know, we'd love to be able to do these massive projects, but you know, I think, you know, maybe sometimes you have to sort of temper our, our ambition slightly. And I, I think know. Maybe right. that's where I come in. Yeah, that, that, that's why we we in, we invite Mark to temper the. No, I think I think it's important. Oh well, of course. I mean, if you really want if you really want a group of people to talk around science and talk about a project, there's yeah. if, if people. I mean, you also want a place where people are comfortable that they can say the idea is terrible and they don't think it's worth pursuing. You want to have that environment because if you have just people who tell you the idea is good, you're going to do a lot of things that somebody else someday later yeah. will tell you it's bad. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, we do have some really good productive discussions productive discussions yes and, ha <laughs> and we have a good laugh which is key yeah, yeah yeah so mark it's a pleasure to talk to you thanks for doing no this people should check out the paper um it is a, a, a very important paper it's uh out now we'll tweet the link we'll put it out in the show notes mark lithgow pleasure great no worries thanks for that